or the fourth point that we talk about is around the hidden signals or the new signals. About a week ago I was speaking at a similar seminar on the Internet of Things and we were also mentioning how wearables are coming in in a very large way in the Indian market and in the global market. In the Internet of Things, as machines get embedded with computers, it's a question of having a steady stream of data supply that is going to feed into your enterprise, that is going to feed into your systems almost on a regular basis. That volume of data, that ability to tap into data, real-time data, sensor data, which might be happening at any point of time, is something which was not there even five years ago. And the ability to tap into this Internet of Things gives you access to data that you previously did not have, be it in a smart city, be it in a surveillance perspective, be it in an anti-terrorism perspective, be it in something as obvious as traffic management, be it as something as minor or mundane as telematics in general insurance, which will allow you to drive analytics further. And we'll give some examples of this. And the final piece is hidden insights, and I'll explain this with an example when I come to it, but it's a question of what is not commonsensical when you take a look at data. What is something that the data throws up? Some of it is pure common sense. Some of it may not be common sense. How do you take a look at these hidden insights when you take a look at analytics? From a Deloitte perspective, we view analytics as a continuum. We have all worked through the times in 97, 98 when we started taking a look at business intelligence and data warehousing. And we have taken a look at the issues around data management, around data governance, like many others in this field, around performance management, moving into <coughs> business intelligence, and also taking a look at the advanced or the predictive analytics, and now taking a look at the sources of data that we previously could not tap into, unstructured data text data, what is there in social media, what is there in your emails, what is there in the blogs, how can you quantify, how can you massage that qualitative data into quantitative data which you can then use in order to drive some of the analytics that might be possible. So therefore when you take a look at analytics, do not think of it as something which is new, which a consultant is trying to sell or a software vendor is trying to position. It is something which is a continuum. It's a part of the information infrastructure that you're building in your organization or in your entity, starting out with the ERP, moving into some of the business intelligence and the reporting pieces, and then evolving into some of these analytics paradigms. What are some of the examples that we see of the applications or the areas of analysis or, or the areas where analytics get applied? We'll give a few examples, but there are workforce analytics. As the CEO of LNT Infotech was saying that he wants to do uh, an actual uh, attrition analytics where he tries to understand who is the person most likely to resign and therefore can he or she be persuaded to stay back. Uh, there are other examples of customer analytics uh, that were given by Oparup and Shudipto in terms of you know, reaching out to a consumer who has a need for insulin or to a particular consumer who perhaps wants to have a better customer experience at Best Buy in, you know, uh, having a female customer serve a female, uh, a female employee serve a female customer. So we talked about workforce, we talked about uh, uh, operational analytics, we talked about customer analytics. There are also increasingly risk analytics and supply chain analytics which are coming in and which are finding a large field in this particular area. Now, the one point that I said is that in terms of a changing ecosystem and data sources, um, you know, in the middle of this is a very traditional diagram of what we had in terms of data sources coming in, feeding into operational data sources or uh, repositories of data, feeding into dimensional data maps and, uh, you know, uh, having the entire analysis coming in. But what is something which is increasing is that where are some of the true sources of non-traditional data come in? Now everyone talks about big data and everyone talks about unstructured big data. Unfortunately, my view on big data in India is there's a lot that companies can still do with data within their organizations even before they try and leverage and exploit the potential of big data. Particularly in terms of big data, everyone jumps to the fact that it is unstructured. There's a significant amount 
of structured big data by which I mean external big data which is available that companies have hardly tapped into. One of the biggest challenges of tapping into big data are the data governance issues where if you do not have common meta models or if you do not have common metadata or data dictionary definitions, even in utilizing something like market research data in an FMCG context from a third party source can prove to be untold challenges. But the point that I'm trying to make out here more than the challenges is that why are we so excited about analytics in India right now? Remember what I talked about in the first slide, the information asymmetry. The inability to know more about your customer if that customer resides in a tier 2 or a tier 3 city or even beyond. Now that is possible. There are mobility solutions, there are other solutions that will allow you to go in and know exactly what the Kirana store owner in Azamgarh is actually ordering as a part of his market basket from your suite of products. Mobility solutions in FMCG, in retail, and particularly in financial services are allowing such companies to reach out to the end consumer beyond the mid-level customer that such companies have already had, be it independent financial advisors in insurance or wholesale dealers and distributors in FMCG, which is allowing them to go in and tap into these data sources, bring in this data on a real-time basis, understand the patterns better. Similarly, the ability to disseminate this information, the ability to take a look at the far more sophisticated community, the one that does a Facebook or increasingly Snapchat or WhatsApp or blogs, and the ability to mine data from this is something which is increasing. Analytics can only work if you have data. The point that we are trying to make out here that the ability to tap into myriad data sources has exploded over the last three to four years. Be it through the Internet of Things, be it through social media, be it through mobility solutions in India to go in and tap into information sources which were previously not accessible. That's what making analytics tick at this point of time. Some examples, and I'll start with a hidden insight. This is for a work that we did for an Indian BPO in terms of attrition analytics. The usual factors all came in. How many years has this person been at a particular level? What is the lifestyle management of this particular, com of this particular person? Uh, there is a sea change in attitudes to traveling once you get married, once you have kids. The hidden insight came from something which was very peculiar. When taking a look at the attrition of very high performance people, one of the things that was noticed that most of these high performance people were actually resigning when put on complex projects where there were a large number, and, and I'm sure in this audience you'll recognize this, where there were a large number of one raters that were put in. What was the reason for that? Every company, fortunately or unfortunately these days, has a concept of a bell curve. And it says that in a particular project, maybe only 15% of the people can be one raters. In a group of 20, where all 20 have been one raters, and you put them in the project, and you say that only five can be one raters, and the others will be two raters or three raters, that causes a certain amount of shock that not everyone is able to absorb. And that causes an attrition out of the top rated performers, all of whom have been, been put on a particular complex project. Now, it makes perfect business sense. You know, it's a complex project, you put in all your one raters, but it's a question of setting your expectations then from an HR perspective. That is an insight that we never expected to come out from our analytics uh, work that we did. And it was something which was very interesting, particularly in an Indian context, that in terms of the ability of the staff to recognize that a two rating or a three rating is not the end of the world. And I see a lot of smiles around because I know this is a real issue that we all face. But it's an interesting insight that when you do analytics, this is something which came out as why people are resigning. The second example I want to give from a regulatory perspective is actually on quality and compliance for one of the largest pharma majors in India. And as you know, pharma majors in India do a lot of production for overseas companies in terms of generics. And these generic manufacturing are guided by extremely strict regulations and extremely strict contracts. So they wanted to have a deep supply chain analytics model which is developed 
which takes a look at the quality of the suppliers, how many of them are slipping up on quality, where are they actually not meeting standards, and tie it into their supply evaluation as a part of the supply chain analytics and understand what better business decisions they need to make from a contractual perspective. We talked about the new data points which are making analytics very interesting and I'll give this example from an insurance major in India. This insurance major took the plunge and decided to give to its top 80% performing uh, independent financial advisors a tablet solution which they had created which allows the agent or the independent financial advisor to capture a lot more data about the end consumer than was previously available. The minute you do that, some very interesting things came up. As Oparup said, you know, it was a question of a female customer and a female employee. Here the issue was two things. When did you visit the female customer when you wanted to sell some life insurance policies to her? Did you visit her at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? If you visited her at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the chances of your success were very low. The second question was that what language did you speak to her in? If you spoke to her in English, the chances of your succeeding were minimal. If you spoke to her in her mother tongue, the chances of being able to sell that policy to her made, you know, went up significantly. All of this is you know, fairly basic common sense. But the point is that without that mobility solution, the ability to tap into these data points, get the data from the field, feed it in on a, real, on a near real-time basis, into your analytics engine was previously not possible. With the analytics ecosystem, this is the type of work that you can actually do in India right now. Final example is from Kolkata. <coughs> this is for a retail major in Kolkata and this is quite interesting. Um, all of us get bombarded with promotions and campaign management pieces uh, from various uh, retail stores. You know, uh, buy one, get one free, buy this at a particular special price without any distinction between who is being targeted. Now, if I am, for example, a vegetarian, you know, offering me a 10% discount on the head of a fish probably doesn't make much sense. I'm not probably going to use the coupon. It's a waste of your time. It's a waste of paper. So therefore, based on the loyalty program that this company is running, what was done was that a market basket analysis the beer and the diapers example taken forward. A market basket analysis was done, a conjoint analysis, where using Bayesian statistics, it was tried to understand that what was the market basket of a particular group of loyalty customers, and based on their consumption, which is then tracked through the loyalty card, it couldn't be done for every consumer because you couldn't track them using a loyalty card, but for the loyalty card customers, understanding their market basket and understanding what is their buying pattern and therefore what are the specific promotions that I can give to this particular person. If there is a particular consumption pattern, can I then give my coupons accordingly? And this is something that was done for a client in Kolkata. So again, some examples that we gave in terms of you know, quality and compliance, in terms of attrition, in terms of customer centricity, in terms of better campaign and marketing management, with the core theme that analytics can now do a lot more than what it did, you know, when I started talking about this, and I remember 97, 98, when we used to talk about data warehousing and also statistical predictive modeling then. And, uh, you know, it was difficult because data quality remained a significant challenge. Data quality is still a challenge in an Indian context, but the sources of data have gone up significantly. One last slide, and this is actually on... Um, something that can be used for government. This is actually something that Deloitte has done in the US, as you can see, for the state of Texas. And if you type in Comptroller General Texas in Google, this will come up. This is actually a online dashboard which tells every citizen of Texas how the government or the state of Texas is spending money on various schemes, where are the payments going into, who are the people receiving the payments. It's an excellent example of how you can use analytics to drive transparency in a government organization. So that actually was my last slide, ladies and gentlemen. If there are some key takeaways from the session, I'd like to just emphasize three points. A, 
our ability to do analytics and derive insight is much greater than before due to the ecosystem of analytics that is evolving and our ability via tools, technologies, ability to handle data volumes, ability to access data sources that we previously did not have in order to drive these analytics. Secondly, the, every analytics has to have a particular business driver behind it. It can be growth, it can be market differentiation, it can be regulatory, it can be the need to understand risks, but unless there is a valid business reason to do this, it's not going to happen technology for technology's sake. And the third point is that in order to do this, you need a strong dose of basic common sense, which as people in Calcutta, we certainly believe we have. And the other part is a good dose of mathematical and analytical skills, which I also think is predominant in this city. So, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. So I must tell you that uh, I consider it as a privilege to be here uh, this afternoon uh, uh, in this city. And I think this initiative uh, is a great initiative. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of people from different parts of the world are going to talk a lot about Kolkata being a city of business analytics. Now, I'd like to take 10 minutes and give you a few examples. Uh, we have been working in many industry sectors, uh, starting from aerospace and defense to consumer goods and retail to life sciences to transportation and mobility to building smart cities. So we've been working in, in, in many sectors. And what we have realized that over a period of last 10 years, the subject of analytics have gone through transformation. The role of science have exponentially increased. Now, one of the reasons being, if you really look at today, if you just manufacture a product, or if you just deliver a services, you do not survive, because product and services have become commodities. So that, that's number one. So in, in olden days, you know, even a even couple of years back, the R&D people could afford to be isolated from the market and they could design brilliant products and launch them in the market and often they found those products got rejected. So today the role of and the power of social has actually increased. So therefore we started talking about not just industry solutions but social industry solutions. Now, I would give you a few examples to explain what I'm trying to uh, express. So, innovation today got to be connected with the end consumers. And if the innovation is not connected with the end consumers, then we would innovate, we would build products and services, but they will be rejected by the end consumers. Friends, I wanted to share with you that today kind of technologies which are available worldwide, I'll give you one example that we have, uh, we have companies which are actually designing products, let's say designing a car, they are virtually creating a digital factory, manufacturing the car in the virtual factory putting the car on the road to understand how will it perform with respect to crash test and showcasing that car to the potential end consumers. So that one aspect. The second aspect is that applications today, they are so powerful, they are not only picking up data which is available with your, uh, within your organization or within your partner in a structured form, but in unstructured form. So we have built 260,000 adapters, which actually picks up data from 
different sources starting from Twitter to Facebook to Economic Times to so on and so forth and it would connect the information that you gather from the unstructured sources with the data that you have in the structured sources and you make use of different algorithm and, and scientific tools to convert them into real intelligent information and represent them as intelligent dashboard for management for decision making not only that but also you allow it to be connected with people who do the innovation now I would like to share with you another example uh, we are working with many countries and, and some of the uh, intelligence agencies in different parts of the world they use our application now imagine a terrorist right I could assure you that they are much better planner than many of us in corporate right now when a terrorist would draw a plan to do a strike let's say on 26 January right uh, they are going to come and announce it and say that I'm going to make an attack on such and such day at such and such place so how do you really pick up a lots of incomplete data available in different sources it could be a crime database it could be past track record it could be symptoms it could be the way a particular person is tweeting it could be the name of a person who got five different things in five different documents and, and, and all of them are different how do you do analysis and figure out is it the same gentleman or not so today the role of scientific tools like fuzzy logic has actually increased we use you know around 40 algorithms to, to offer solution on how do you track terrorists how do you really figure out where are you likely to have uh, a potential potential threat now uh, another, another uh, example that I wanted to share with you that uh, we have a project right now in United States where talking, talking about when a patient will go to a doctor doctor is going to take a quick digital image of the heart of the patient and you will have the digital model of a specific patient who has entered into your room and you will do the diagnosis of problem in the digital heart and if you have to conduct a surgery you would conduct a surgery on the digital heart if you have to administer a medicine you would administer a digital medicine on the digital heart to understand the impact now this kind of solutions you know I can assure you that the traditional way of looking at analytics the traditional way of uh, analyzing the ocean of data is just not going to work it actually involves really making use of a lot of scientific tools powerful algorithm algorithm which are capable of analyzing data both complete and incomplete and then convert them into real information thank you very much